author of our Croatian book coming up here, right? Okay. And uh, sort of give a little advertising space here while we warm up. <laughs> mm. And if you want to review the book before it's published, yeah, you're looking for reviewers. Uh -huh. And uh, I have accepted to write a kind of introductory foreword on the history of uh, Agile. Like so that in so both Croatian and English it's going to come. So. <laughs> If anybody's really crazy and they, they can dig up the slides on their iPhone and follow from their seats. There they are. Slides. And if you're really, really crazy, you can parallel listen to a video talk of the same talk. <laughs> a stereo video. Okay, time to start the talk on time. Or is that not done in Croatia? <laughs> a little bit yeah. academic court. As long as they're streaming in, maybe I should give them a chance. So. Yeah. Close the door. Dobro jutro. Okay. And uh, so everybody gets a shot at it. Here's your Croatian book on Agile coming up, first and only. Um, and coming out soon, May. Okay, you just have to photograph that. Yeah, right. <laughs> you want to get me and it? Yeah, okay. Ta da! Read the book. Voila. <laughs> Molim. Okay. Still coming. Oh, goodness, all these late people. Oh, well, you and I were boozing until midnight, so I understand. So, <laughs> Mike, welcome. Okay. <laughs> So uh, uh, I was asked to speak here at uh, Agile Conference. So I was quite surprised when they didn't pick all my Agile lectures that I do. They picked this power to the programmers. Uh, this is not a programming conference, is it? How many people here are like Kent Beck? They would rather program. <laughs> yeah, a lot of programmers here. So maybe this is why this got picked. So OK, fine. Uh, so. If you want to complain uh, or a question, uh, you can find my email there, sort of in code, so no hacker would ever find my email. <laughs> and then website. Uh, these are the site of the slides. I put them up yesterday. There may be some small changes. And uh, this is a video of a previous uh, version. This will be videoed, of course, but we're not quite sure when we get access to the link. OK. Uh, when I was... Uh, 17 years old and a young schoolboy in London, they decided we should have exchange with Yugoslavia for one month. So we rode <coughs> the train from London, believe it or not, all the way to Beograd. When we came to Ljubljana, <coughs> nobody could pronounce this crazy sounding word with LJ. So we British schoolboys decided to call Ljubljana just number one. It was the first <laughs> big stop on the way. And we passed through Zagreb, I'm quite sure. How else could we get to Beograd? And uh, I spent the next month, uh, two weeks, in Beograd uh, visiting Dusan Toskovic. And in Slovenska, seven was the exact address. And then two weeks later, we were all in Mali Loshin, uh, enjoying the sun and the beautiful Serbian girls in their bikinis. <laughs> I was only 17. I was quite innocent. So <laughs> and uh, I, I tried to study Croatian as best I could. So I, we, I spent almost all my time, even around the swimming pool, learning Croatian from my Croatian friends. Well, Serbo-Croatian, to be quite honest. They were mostly Serbs. Okay. But uh, that was my hobby. When I got back to London, I wrote my little diary in, in uh, Serbian. And if I couldn't remember a Serbian word, I put in a Spanish word, because I was studying Spanish. So I have the weirdest diary. It's uh, half Spanish, half Croatian, something like that. <clears throat> anyway, I, I fell in love with uh, uh, Yugoslavia and Yugoslavians at an early stage, especially Sonia and Sali my two little girlfriends from uh, Novi Sad. I never forget them. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, so uh, in 1972, I was invited by the uh, uh, University of Ljubljana to hold a three-day course on uh, 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 
uh, what's it called? Managing, uh, uh, where's the exact title? I didn't manage to get in there. Uh, but, but, you know, managing uh, things. Uh, eight lectures, three days. And we were there in uh, uh, Boyd. And uh, the first, first lecture I held was explaining Agile. And this is 1972. I explained it was a good idea to try to deliver value early, small increments, learn from it, make better decisions, do more, and keep on accumulating the value. That's called my EVO method. Okay? This is the uh, uh, first published Agile method. There were lots of Agile methods floating around, but I managed to get to the publication first, okay? as we'll see. Uh, and uh, after my first lecture on uh, uh, the Agile method known as EVO, big discussion amongst the people. There were uh, 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 two people who became very good friends of mine, uh, Willem Rupnik. I think he's no longer with us, but his son is in fact a professor in Ljubljana. We've managed to track and trace. Somebody here had a Facebook account with him. Now we have LinkedIn. So I'm going to hook up with him for fun because I, I dearly loved uh, Rupnik. And uh, uh, Professor Leskovar was especially dear to me uh, because he was born the same day as I was, <laughs> Christmas Eve. <laughs> and we have uh, kept contact, and he's uh, alive and well and retired. Uh, but, um, and there were professors from not just uh, uh, um, Ljubljana, but also Zagreb and other uh, universities there. So maybe you know somebody who was there. You can check out with them. Anyway. Uh, big discussion, blah, 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 and of course, a language I didn't know quite what they were saying, but it was very animated. So I asked them, why the big discussion? You know, I just put across some common sense ideas. You should do things in small steps and deliver real value and learn from it. Why big discussion? And they said, uh, I should introduce this on, on the way. Uh, <laughs> it has something to do with Tito, of course. Uh, in 57, in Beograd, uh, Tito happened to be hosting Ho Chi Minh. And so uh, there was a big parade, and they were in a big open car, sort of looked like the open boat there. And I saw both of them with my very own eyes. So I'm, uh, you weren't even born, right? How many people were not born in, yet in 1957? I thought so. So I, I, I beat you to that one. I saw Tito and Ho Chi Minh on the sa same time. That's really good. I brag about that to my Vietnamese friends, and I brag about that here. I'm not quite sure what this says. I, w I didn't have time to get a translation, but I'm sure it's something horrible, like wanted for a terrorist or something like that. Yeah? So, uh, OK. But uh, I think this might have been almost the same day I saw them, so it looks like. He was, uh, Tito's taking him for a boat, a boat ride, right? And he's obviously giving him an extra hat, which he's not very comfortable with. So anyway. But uh, so they, they said, well, uh, Tom, we have to explain to you. Um, in 1945, Tito essentially gave us a, uh, an assignment, um, you know, replan Yugoslavia, make it better uh, society. And we are professors of economics and professors of engineering, and we, we got this job. And we got some really great revolutionary ideas because, of course, we're revolutionary, right? So uh, big bang, waterfall ideas, we could call them today. And we were in a hurry, because revolutions are in a hurry. So we, um, uh, we implemented our revolution the first year. Well, it didn't work very well, so we gave it up. But we had a better idea. So the next year, we implemented a new and better revolution. And it didn't work either. And we kept on doing this. And we're still doing it, they said, 1972. And the discussion is that we realized that if we had used the method you suggested, you know, just do a little bit, but do it very well and make sure it works and learn from it and then increment. Then we might have been a lot further along in our society than all these big bang revolutions. So we can call this safely the introduction of agile in Yugoslavia from 1972. And these are professors of computer science, etc. we're talking to too. So, uh, okay. so I thought you... Uh, might enjoy the story because it's true. <laughs> okay. Um, my talk here is uh, the recognition that a lot of decision making by managers, directors, and uh, architects are is sort of top down uh, command and control direction. And there is some evidence, which I'll give you detailed case studies, that if we delegate the power to the programmer level, I'll call it that, the dev level, okay. 
the worker level, things will actually be done better and more intelligently. That's uh, nine minutes after my talk, snooze alarm. <laughs> Better turn the whole thing off or I'll get a call from somewhere. Um, okay. Uh, and and that this delegation of power will lead to uh, uh, far faster uh, and higher quality uh, uh, systems and projects. That's the thesis of the talk. Grassroots developers can change and measure uh, measure real uh, value delivery often and early. So that means they can test out their ideas. And if there are bad ideas, they can change them right away. The director and architect is too far away in time and space to do that. Okay? So it's a matter of uh, letting the people who can test and measure that their ideas are working, to, that we need to delegate the power to. Um, I have a nasty habit which people always complain about, so to just avoid hearing any complaints, I love slides filled with lots and lots and lots of text. I hate slides with beautiful pictures and one word. I can't read them afterwards. I forget completely what anybody said. Okay, so uh, I, uh, my slides with lots of detail are sending another message. I have real experience and it's detailed and it can be checked. I don't just have some nice theories I'm waving at you. That's the other message. It's real. Okay. So if you don't like that, close your eyes and just listen to my soothing words or something like that. Okay. Uh, if you really want to know uh, that Tom can hold a talk with pretty pictures and few words, you might like to get this 17 and a half minute video. Uh, and uh, uh, enjoy. They, Ted forced me to be simple. And it's actually a much better talk than I usually ever hold, but I wasn't allowed to give people lots of technical details. That's uh, because we're not talking to my geek friends, as they put it to me at Ted anymore. So you're my geek friends. You can read whole pages of code. Surely you can read a slide. Okay? And if you can't read it now, don't worry. You can read it afterwards, or you can pull it up on your iPhone now and check it out, or whatever you like, okay? Uh, I have to admit, I was a coder. And I was a coder for about 20 years. Uh, that's all there was when we started. In fact, it was so early that we were plugging plug boards for part of the coding, okay? It was early, early computers all had plug boards for like their printers and things like that. And, uh, uh, but then something emerged called uh, projects and project management and design as systems got larger and larger. And I got interested in that stuff. I frankly, after 20 years, was quite bored with coding and have no intention to ever return to it. Okay? And I hope you also will grow up. Uh, good to have this grounding in coding, right? First-hand knowledge. That's me at uh, about six years old in Malibu, California. Uh, next door to the film star Bing Crosby, by the way. My mother had, uh, was a millionaire capitalist and a communist at the same time. Could beat that. <laughs> she had the money and she kept it, and she gave it away to all the Marxist-Leninist societies in London, finally, instead of me. That's why, that's why I have to work for a living. Yeah. Okay, so basically, I, I, uh, this, this term, about 68, the term software engineer popped up, and my father was an engineer. And I knew sort of what that was. He had 100 inventions. And I invent methods still. But I don't patent them. I sort of copyright them. Okay? Um, but uh, uh, and it seemed like a good idea. Uh, we, we had already chaos in programming in the early uh, 50s and 60s. Um, too many big, really big projects, like some of the projects IBM had, building operating systems, had a Chinese army, as they called it, of quite a lot of people. And uh, you know, a mess uh, already from the beginning. Uh, so, uh, but, but I then went out and discovered there was no software engineering. There were no papers, textbooks, courses, or people who knew what they were doing. It just was an engineering concept that we were going to add on to programming so that programming could handle big, complex, high-quality tasks. Okay? So I said, okay, it's not there. Uh, I guess I'll have a little bit of fun. I will try to invent it and develop it together with my uh, comrades. Okay? So that's how I got into this business. Now, frankly, I'm going to try and sell you an idea that you shouldn't do agile programming. You should do agile engineering. Hmm? By the way, how many people have a degree that has something like the word engineering in it? 
Wow, the vast majority, right? So that should be good. I'm speaking to the right people. See, I, my theory is programmers couldn't care less about this, but engineers recognize it and think it's an interesting idea. So there's uh, some hope uh, for you, okay? That's not one of my first girlfriends, that's my sister. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Now, uh, here's another thing I'd like to introduce. Uh, I'm, I'm a real grandfather of five grandchildren, and that's uh, one of the greatest pleasures in life, so be sure to get some children, even though it's tempting to skip the children phase, go straight to the grandchildren phase sometimes. Uh, but uh, since I was so early, I was writing about this and that. In 1960, any of you born then? No. In 1960, I did my first Agile project. I did, it was for a, a, as an invoicing system for a clothing manufacturer, but and I, I, they had their old system going, which wasn't on computers, but I moved it over to the new computer systems in 20 incremental steps. Every step gave a benefit or real value to my customer, okay? And we plugged in, we built on that. That was Agile, 1960, okay? You think I was the first one doing that? No. We have, uh, courtesy of Craig, Craig Larman, we have traced it back to early rocket projects starting from about 1945. They're doing uh, agile software, but they're, it's secret stuff, so they aren't exactly publicizing what they're doing for the Russians, or the Soviets. Sorry, let's get this straight, okay? Uh, so, uh, I, I managed to write both uh, books and, uh, and papers in the 70s, uh, which when anybody does research who published ideas about incremental delivery and Agile first, uh, I get the honor. So, I'm the grandfather. Um, and, and these guys uh, are very clear about it, so here are some quotes from all of your favorite Agile manifesto signers saying, Tom was first, Tom is the grandfather, okay? So I, I'm happy to be the grandfather, you are my grandchildren, okay? <laughs> uh, um, here's a lovely quotation uh, which is suitable for the software business. Uh, if, uh, if, if people learn the hard way certain things and then they retire, and the new generation comes and they didn't learn these things, then this new generation is going to have to have the same problems and maybe learn the same things again. What a waste. I mean, that's why we have universities and books and grandfathers, to transmit the information to the new generation so they don't have to screw up and screw up and screw up. But we have a culture where we have screwed up for about 50 years and we don't seem to learn anything. We're just grabbing the latest fad, you know, agile, lean, Kanban, what's the next? Huh? Maybe, ah, agile engineering. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're, we're a fashion industry and we're looking for the latest fashion. We're not saying is this latest fashion, you know, healthier or better for you, just is it the latest fashion? We're gonna do it. And I'm afraid that's where we are. And of course, none of you are like that. You are rational engineers looking for measurable ideas. I know that. But the other guys in this business are dragging us along, especially the managers. Ah, we've got to go lean. Everybody's going lean. Okay, do lean. Okay. Um, here's a map from uh, this book of the uh, uh, history of some of our uh, methods. Uh, uh, interesting book, by the way, Value Stream by Mark uh, Kennelly. Uh, is very critical of Agile, as some of the uh, talks have been here. Uh, it's very critical of Agile that doesn't produce clear results and meet its promises, okay? But it's very much an uh, interesting book about Agile and uh, uh, very deep, very philosophical, very good at digging in history. So I highly recommend uh, this book too, Value Stream. Uh, but I, I, I had to admit I, I loved the, their tracing. You see down there, believe it or not, if you can compare the picture, that's me, okay? <laughs> Uh, standing on the shoulders of Dr. Deming's system of profound knowledge, plan, do, study, act cycles, which many of you will know, right? But not a direct descendant. I, I didn't learn Deming's methods till 83. Then I had 23 years of practicing it, as you know, okay? But we were friends, actually, Deming and I. That is, I used to take him to the ballet in London and things like that. Uh, but here's Tom Guild with Evo, uh, it says 76 to 88. 88 is the publication of my book that all the Agile Manifesto guys read, Principles of Software Engineering Management. And then there's a straight line right up to Agile Manifesto and beyond. So I thought, well, I can certainly claim I'm the grandfather with that one. That's 
That's very nice. Okay. But there are other interesting branches here, some of which go nowhere and, and, and things like that. Like SSADM ends up with a dead end of some kind in, in England. Um, so, okay, so I, 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 my son got married in India, so I, I had my guru suit on, and I thought that's a nice way of symbolizing uh, gurus. That's, by the way, my wife, my oldest son, and my youngest son, Kai. Kai works with me, so one day he'll probably come back with me to do some uh, uh, things in, in uh, or maybe even hold a lecture here. But he's windsurfing right now in Hawaii. That's what he does. He has this work-life balance. 10 months windsurfing and then two months working, 10 months windsurfing. He's crazy, but he pulls it off. That, that is what you, if, if you learn my methods, you, like he did, you can do the same thing. 10 months windsurfing in Hawaii. Sometimes he even takes his family along for 10 months, believe it or not, to Hawaii. It's amazing, but uh, that's where he is right now. That is, today he's starting on the journey back to Norway, actually. Okay. Now, the so, so basic idea of the talk is that we can get measurably better results if we delegate the power, if the directors and architects don't make hard decisions, they, they make one decision, you have the power to make the detailed decision. You will make it evolutionarily, iteratively. Okay? You are empowered to do it and to fail if you need to, but learn quickly. So that's the basic idea of the uh, talk. Uh, in, uh, uh, I, I bash uh, Agile freely, after all, it's my own... Uh, uh, I'm the grandfather, so I can criticize my family, okay? And uh, I bash architects happily. So here's an architectural conference in London, and uh, 300 architects, half from uh, the continent, half from Britain. And I, uh, you can pick up a video of it if you like. But I asked them very early a simple question. Let's say you are architecting something specialized like security architecture. And you lay down your security ideas on the table, encryption, password, whatever, okay? How many of you actually try to estimate the cost of what you are suggesting? Three hands went up out of 300. So you have a culture that doesn't care about cost. No wonder some of our systems run over cost and are expensive. They're just putting these expensive toys on the table, have no idea how many millions of whatever euro you want to have, and then uh, and the companies are happily implementing their stupid architectural ideas, which don't work, but do cost a lot of money. So then I ask the second question. How many of you, when you lay an architectural idea on the table, try to estimate how good it is, how much effect it has, how fast it will catch a hacker? One person out of 300 put up his ideas. But this is not just the architecture culture. This, unfortunately, is our software culture. We don't seem to care very much about cost or effectiveness, but we all have ideas, and we love them, and we do them. And then our projects fail 50% of the time, uh, run, uh, even our, I'll never forget uh, um, uh, Jeff Sutherland bragging at the uh, Warsaw Agile Conference, normal projects fail 40% of the time, but scrum projects only fail 19% of the time. Huh? What if I were a heart surgeon, and you needed a heart transplant, see? <laughs> And you asked me, are you qualified, Tom, to transplant my heart? I said, yeah, sure. You know, the other surgeons, they kill two out of three patients on the operating table. I only kill one. Uh, by the way, I just did four successful operations, and you're next. <laughs> That's us. We are so bad, it is criminal, or ought to be a criminal offense. We are destroying interesting parts of society by having such bad systems as we have in government and private. So, so are we ever going to change? I mean, this has been going on forever, okay? So uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if we'll change, but uh, uh, I hope that uh, we, I think to do l large complex systems, we have to do more engineering, and we have to be more conscious of the numbers, which is what engineers and scientists do, okay? For the effect of what we're doing, the qualities of what we're doing, and the costs. Anyway. Uh, you might enjoy that talk, or if you have some architect, architect friends, uh, IT architect, of course, then you can point that to them. Okay, so, so basically, we're going to uh, delegate the power of making design decisions and other deci prioritization decisions to the small team of maybe four people, uh, a platoon working in parallel, as Mary was talking about yesterday on a very large uh, project. And we are uh, what I'm going to encourage you to do is consider becoming a real software engineer. Okay? 
uh, in 1960s, when the term first cropped up, it really just meant programmer. Okay? It did not mean any kind of recognized engineer. There were certainly no degrees in it, and nobody was doing anything except programming. One day they were a programmer who did COBOL. The next day they were a software engineer doing the same COBOL. Okay? But the important thing is that we're now ready to put some reality behind it. We could train software engineers. In fact, on Thursday I'll be going to Algebra, uh, is, is the name of the university, which trains software engineers and systems engineers and holding a lecture there. And to the electrical engineering faculty at 2 o'clock on Thursday, okay? which is an engineering faculty. So I hope they're doing engineering. We'll see. And uh, hold some lectures. Uh, maybe I get a second chance since 1972 to tell them about Agile. They have actually requested hearing about Agile from me at these uh, places. Okay, so, uh, 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 by the way, how, just out of curiosity, how many of you in your dreams would like to be a real first-class software engineer? How many of you couldn't give a shit, you'd rather continue programming? <laughs> At least one honest man in the room. <laughs> Okay. Well, okay, I'm going to give some case studies in support of this. Uh, first, uh, we have the uh, different cultures. Uh, here, here, of course, is the computer programmer. I don't know if you can see why he's the computer programmer and the others are not. But uh, we are definitely a different race. So here we are at this wonderful bathing hotel. I don't know. Uh, I didn't go in the swimming pools yet. And somebody asked me, I said, no, no, I don't intend to. I want to talk to my geek friends all the time. So whole, I'll be here a whole day talking to people if you want to talk. I'll be here whole tomorrow holding a course on lean quality assurance, by the way, if you haven't uh, uh, noticed that. So I, I, I'd rather do that. And uh, I don't know, I can swim home in Norway in the fjord when it gets a little warmer. That'll be fine. Okay. Um, okay. So um, it, here are the two organizational design ideas. One is top-down command and control. The directors say, we're going to do lean. The directors say, we're going to have an IT system. It's going to solve all the problems. Build it. And we want to keep a job, so we build it. Uh, what it's going to do for the CEO, we don't know. We don't care. We're getting paid for programming. Uh, I think partly we need to take another responsibility. I think we need to take a responsibility for making sure that these executives with money get what they want. They get real value, real results, measurable stuff, not just an IT system that fails. That's pretty uninteresting and pretty much a shame that we uh, deliver that and you know, think we're doing something great because we did it in Agile, even though, of course, it delivered no value. But the code got delivered, the, the use cases got delivered, there were no bugs in it, and it, the velocity of delivering the wrong stuff was 10 times faster than normal. We've got to get out of that mode. Our pride should be in something pretty simple. Things got better. Qualities went up. People saved time. Okay? The hospitals treated their patients better. And that kind of thing. Okay? We, 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 uh, that should be our pride. I participated in a system that made life better for nurses in the hospital. And they will tell you. Did you code? I forget. We built systems. And yeah, I guess we did some coding too. Okay, but we made life better for the uh, nurses. We have to go over, not only to engineering, but we actually, even though we're software people, we have to go over to systems engineering and think about the whole system. That means the nurses and their culture and the older systems in the hospital. Yeah? You can't just plug in a nice chunk of software, walk away and say, I've done my job, it functions, it has no bugs. That's too narrow, it's irresponsible. And you should be ashamed of yourself if you're in that mode. Okay. So uh, what we need to do is move over from a command and control thing to, ah, looks some, sort of like an agile plan, do, study, act, deming cycle, this one. Okay? A learning cycle where we plug stuff in early and we measure and we learn from it and we adjust. And we keep on doing this until people don't need any more improvement. That's the new model. Okay? And in that new, so management's basically saying, use that new model. Forget hierarchical command and control. You know, don't listen to the directors, even though they're powerful. Just tell them, go away. You directors have one responsibility. Decide how good you want it to be. We will make it so good. But leave us alone. Let us measure that we're delivering what you said you wanted. 
Okay? We will do a better job faster if you leave us alone and don't suggest designs and architectures because the, the suppliers of the hardware and software have whispered into your ear that they should do this and that's very modern. And the director said, yeah, it's very, okay, we'll do that. And then we do that even though we think it's stupid. That kind of thing. We've got to get out of that mode. Get, get focused on delivering real, valuable results to our stakeholders. Okay? So uh, here's... Uh, Here's a little case study. In 1970, Ron Radis, who invented capability maturity model, CMM, and Michael Fagan, both two good uh, friends of mine, uh, co-invented a thing called inspection, software inspection. I wrote a book on it in 1993, Software Inspection with Dorothy Graham. Okay? Um, uh, the, um, uh, Michael Fagan was very clear about one thing. He wanted to use inspection uh, to gather data about bugs and problems, to analyze them, so as to find the root causes. We're, we're, we're back to Deming and statistical process control now, uh, which he acknowledged, he'd read and learned. And, uh, and then to fix the system, to fix the recurrence, the, the, the root cause of why do we have 2,000 bugs a year? Is there one single thing, uh, like better training for the programmers we could give, which would reduce that, which would prevent the defects getting in? That was his dream, but he failed to do it. And I, I was with him failing. I, I, I thought, that's a good dream, let's do it, but we never got it to work. Um, Later, uh, 10 years later, uh, Robert Mays and Linda Jones of IBM, same IBM, different place, uh, came along and they solved the problem. And they solved the problem by delegating the power of analysis of the bugs to the programmers rather than Michael Fagan as a director collecting a database of everything happening. So again, Fagan failed because he was uh, too high up. His statistics were too general. The, uh, uh, the programmers, when analyzing their bugs, they were the ones who made the bug yesterday. Uh, they knew the reason, like the baby was crying all night and they were sleepy, but they felt they had to come into work. They knew the fix, uh, allow people to come into work after they've had a good night's sleep. That's something that just didn't occur to these command and control uh, bureaucrats like Fagan who believe that managers should run the show and we will collect data and we'll tell all the programmers what to do. Okay, they totally failed. And a little awakener for me, wow, that's why we failed. I, I didn't figure it out, I wasn't smart enough. But Robert Mays uh, was, and they published their work 10 years later. Uh, they delegated to the developers to analyze their own defects and fix their own process. That's delegation of power. So this, in, in an IBM, uh, this is thousands and thousands of programmers who are spending maybe a half an hour per week analyzing bugs, let's call them that, but there are other kinds of defects such as bad requirements, bad uh, architecture, bad test planning, and they're analyzing why is this recurrent. Uh, it's what uh, Deming calls uh, common, they're looking for common causes, one little thing that causes 2,000 bugs, uh, rather than one little thing that just happened once and there is no common cause and there's no point in fixing it, it wouldn't pay off. Because uh, those are called special causes. This is fundamental theory of statistical process control. Look it up, of Deming, Duran, and ultimately their uh, Short, Walter Short. Uh, okay. Um, the, um, the method was so successful that I visited Robert at his office, and there was a big uh, placard there signed Lou Gest Gerstner, who was the chairman of IBM, saying, Thank you, Robert, for doing a major thing for IBM. That's big, and by the way, here's a $100,000 prize to send your children to university. It's very expensive in the US. Okay, so it was a big thing at IBM. It was uh, making major changes. The interesting thing I found is that uh, most people have never even heard of the defect prevention process invented by Robert Mace. By the way, it is in chapters 7 and 17 of my software inspection book, if you'd like to pick up something. Uh, this book is still selling. <laughs> and if you can't afford it, I'll give you electronic copies of it on request. You can, you can find his papers if you know where to search. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, so how many people here, before they walked in here, have heard of the process known as defect prevention process by Robert Mays? Yeah, well, well, but he's from Holland, so that doesn't count, Ben. <laughs> yeah, of course you have. Yeah, so, so here, here's, this is why I'm the grandfather. You know, I was there, I met the guys, I knew how powerful it was, and like everybody's forgotten it ever existed. 
okay? Because the people who are doing it have retired and, and new people came in through universities that did not teach such interesting ideas. It should, this should be taught at university level. It's so powerful, okay? It, 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 you see, one thing is using testing to find and fix defects. But you know what? It is 13 times more cost effective to prevent them. <laughs> so, and, and, and uh, it, 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 by the way, preventing a defect is the same as finding it with 100% probability and correcting it at zero cost. Very attractive. No problem. Okay. So, uh, okay. Now, here's a case study uh, of using it. There's the link if you want the 80 page paper, which is well worth reading. It's just a grand insight. Uh, this particular effort at Raytheon won the prize from Software Engineering Institute for best software engineering improvement effort one year, okay? And uh, in order to uh, win the prize, it's like uh, if you patent something, you have to tell somebody what the, what the technology is. You have to share it, okay? So they had to share their secrets of how they got so good. This is a defense supplier with Patriot missiles being supplied, okay? And, um, uh, but, uh, so, so basically, uh, there, you, they, they very carefully cite that two of the major things they did to achieve these great results, which I'll talk about in a moment, they um, were using inspection, which is quality control and review by peers, okay? In other words, uh, every, every inspection team contains the person who wrote the document and a few buddies, okay? There is no outside auditor who comes in. There is no manager reviewing it. Okay, so this is delegation. Inspection is, and always has been, peer review or delegation of power to the programmers from 1970. The okay? uh, problem with inspection was it was completely focused on finding defects and fixing them early. And that was its only merit. It did the same thing as tested, but it did it at a point in time where it's 10 times cheaper to repair the bug if you found it. But it was equally bad. I'm not uh, taking questions this hour, or you are just scratching your head. I just wanted to, is inspection the same as code review in your context? No. Okay. No. Uh, I'm holding a whole course on this tomorrow. I hope you're coming. Okay. Uh, no. Code review just means somebody is eyeballing the code. Code inspection means you have a rigorous engineering process and are collecting and using data to drive it. That's the short answer. Long answer, read my book. 500 pages. I, I, here, let's go back. I mean, there's, there's a 500-page book on what is uh, inspection and not a review, okay? So the answer is there, okay? If you can't afford it, I'll give you an electronic copy, okay? I'm not selling you any books. I want to I wanna sell you the ideas for free, best I can. That's my job. I'm the grandfather. Anyway, so they're using inspection quite heavily, uh, and they call that a main motor or something like that of the whole improvement process. Then they add the defect prevention process, the one that came 10 years later, in addition, which analyzes the stream of bugs and problems, finds the root causes, and tries to change things. And they cite the defect prevention process as uh, you know, a, a primary driver of the whole process. Okay? But what's happening? Well, in uh, 1988, they discovered something interesting, which you will discover if you look 43, they have a thousand programmers. 43% of all work is muda, waste. Okay? Oh, the lean people are always talking about that for some strange reason. Get rid of waste. Okay? What does waste mean? Well, they have a long list of categories, but it's finding a bug and fixing it and retesting it, which you wouldn't have to do if you didn't do the bug in the first place. So therefore, it's waste from the point of view that you didn't do it right in the first place. 43, so 430 of 1,000 programmers are busy fighting bugs they themselves have put in there. Now, that's about as stupid as an army of 1,000 soldiers, where 430 are tending the wounded they themselves have shot with friendly fire. Who needs enemies? Who needs enemies in software when you have software people who happily use half their time doing totally wasteful effort? 43%. Now, if, if, how many people know, because they have investigated, how much waste the programmers are doing in your environment? How many people have, a, have some data? Ben, Linders, yeah, talk to Ben. <laughs> He's been studying this at Ericsson, okay. So, but none of you, right? Well, let me tell you something. Until you prove otherwise, you can safely assume 50% of all programmer work is totally wasteful and not necessary, and you could get rid of it. But 
you have to learn to not put the bugs in. Because once you put them in, you're going to have that wasteful cost. So the question is, how do we avoid putting bugs in? And the simple answer is, there are many reasons why people put bugs in. It could be bad requirements. It could be sleepy coder. Many reasons. But if you analyze the frequent reasons, analyze the root cause, change things, and measure whether people are less frequently inserting the bugs, then you will have prevented the bugs. And we'll give you some data on how much prevention. Notice I'm already data-driven here. Okay? They started out with that they had 43% uh, uh, rework or waste. Okay? Rework is called. Um, okay. Now, uh, the Deming theory says that the first thing you do when doing statistical process control is to stabilize the system so it isn't going this way all the time. It's sort of like, mm, like that. So that when you make a change, an improvement, you can see the effect of the change. And it's exactly like a scientific experiment. One cause is the cause of the effect. And sim simplifying. Not 50 things and it went better, but we don't know why. When you adopt the whole of Agile, you have that situation. Too many things going on at the same time. You don't know what is good and bad, but if it works a little bit better, something must be good. But something could be very bad. Okay, so, so what they did was they pulled out and dusted off their standards for software engineering. Of course, they had, but nobody was reading or doing because they were in a hurry to write the code. And they said, you will follow these standards no matter how bad they are. Okay, now it turns out, uh, the, 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 previously it was uh, laissez-faire. Uh, everybody does their own thing. Uh, every programmer does whatever they want. Okay, they weren't really following any guidelines. So some people were maybe even doing better than the guideline, some people worse, some people about the same. Now, the moment you strictly enforce a guideline, everybody does it, you see what happens. What happened to them is they actually had a drop to about 27% in one year. Waste, in other words, following the standard was better than allowing the programmers to do whatever the hell they wanted in an undisciplined way. Okay, but 27% it's still bad. <laughs> the standards were so bad, you could say the standards were causing 27% waste. What do you have to do to get down to a much lower number? And the answer is change the standards, change anything resembling a guideline or practice or tool, so that every time you change it, you get lower and lower re-waste. That is the defect prevention process. This is being driven by the programmers themselves making the decisions, what is wrong and how we're going to fix it, and fixing it and measuring. Sometimes they're delegating some of this work, like um, implementation in a large organization, a measurement to a process improvement team. Okay, but they make the initial find and analysis of the defects. So uh, it took eight years, but they got down to uh, 5%. And another two years, they got down to about 3%. So basically, you're doubling the productivity of the programmers by getting rid of the waste, using the defect prevention process to improve things, an engineering technique, and using the inspection process and testing to gather data on frequent defects that need to be analyzed by the programmers so they can find the root cause. You see how this is a cooperative thing? So we're using inspections not to clean up bugs, but to get evidence of bugs, <laughs> evidence of their frequency. We totally changed the mode. We're using testing data and field data for the same purpose. So there's a stream of things gone wrong, and we're looking for frequent things gone wrong that may have one common cause, and we're trying to redesign the organization. But the first and res most respected suggestion is the programmers themselves are going to say, it turns out if a manager decides what to do, he's going to decide to do uh, Kanban. Okay? If a programmer decides what to do, he's going to decide, I should come in late after I've slept. Very much more practical. Okay? It turns out the pro most of the suggestions from programmers are not technical. They're environmental, like noise, space, tools, uh, communication, better beer, whatever. Okay? They're, 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 they're changing their work environment so they're not under pressure to commit bugs. And, and the work environment could include better training, better coaching, better information about what they're doing. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, by the way, um, at one point, 
they made a, a, a guess as to what was wrong and they changed their process. But then the numbers started going in a bad direction. So they immediately yanked out the bad architecture of their organization and put in something better and got back on track. So they're not just believing in new methods and plugging them in for a few years and saying, gee, they don't work. I mean, on, on a, a cyclical basis. This, this is agile organizational engineering. They're doing it in cycles of learning and measuring, learning and measuring. Okay, same thing we would do with our software product, except the software here is the thousand programmers. Okay, let me just, okay. G, time flies in good company, far too fast. I better push on. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things they did in 26 projects, they measured the productivity and it went up by, uh, you know, uh, almost three times, 2.7 times more code produced as a result of getting rid of the waste. Okay. Uh, another dramatic thing they managed to do was they had a 40% budget overrun, which is unpleasant if you have a fixed price contract and you're losing money. And in one year, whoosh, no cost overrun forever. This is called perfect project management from the point of view of keeping the budget and costs. That's amazing. You didn't know that anybody had ever done that, but I know several people who've done that have total control of large software projects, okay? Um, but you've forgotten or you never learned because you're so young and you have to listen to grandpa telling you that we long ago figured out how to avoid anything running over cost or time. We did this in the 1970s and 80s. Did you forget? No, you never learned. Your professors never learned. I'm sad. But grandfather will be teaching some professors on Thursday. To, <laughs> there's hope. I, I, they, they think I'm there to talk to the students, and I, I, I know why. I'm there to talk to the professors, <laughs> frankly. That's where we got to get them. Okay. Uh, here are some of the process improvements made, just uh, cut and paste <coughs> list, but you know, things with testing, things with uh, coding, uh, 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 things with the requirements, not least, and things like that. Those are just some of the real changes they made to give you a feeling for what, it, what are the improvements that went in there. But the improvements are not just, I found a new fashion. They're, I have a real problem. We are generating 1,000 bugs a month from the same common cause. Okay, I think if I do X, I'll fix it. So I plug in X and I measure. Wow, I avoided 900. That's a good fix. That's engineering. That's organizational engineering when you do it with numbers and not intuition and beliefs and fashion. Okay. Uh, defect density went down by a factor of three. That's bugs in the field. Okay. This is a rocket, <laughs> a Patriot missile rocket, embarrassing with bugs that blow it up in the midair or hit the wrong target, you know, so serious business. Um, they found that investing in these methods didn't cost very much because they quickly proved it gave a return on investment of $7.70 for every dollar invested. So excuses like we don't have the money or we don't have the time are invalid. You don't have the time not to do it. You don't have the money not to do it. Got it? They did a very clever thing. They, say, they, they put this data in front of the financial director and said, you should give us a lot more money. This is how good we are. And so they collected a lot more money for doing improvement than when they first had. And the other people who just said, we're doing lean, didn't get any money because they had no results to show. What results do you have to show from your Agile? What numbers can you put on the table, a return on investment? How often have we heard a lecture here on the return on investment from Agile? Zero. I've been in uh, every lecture I go to all three places, try and pick up what's going on. I didn't see any numbers largely, okay? Hmm. So we need to talk about you know, what it costs, what it does, like good engineers, okay? Uh, that's the defect prevention process, which we're not gonna go through in detail, but it is described in the literature in detail. And basically it's a peer process. What bugs do we wanna look at? Because we think they're frequent. What do we think is the root cause? What do we think is the design in our organization? Let's try it out. It's amazing, it's absolutely grassroots power, okay? Um, Okay, we can, uh, I'm going to skip some slides because I'm running into my last 
uh, 15 minutes. Here's from uh, uh, experience I had at uh, what is now Boeing. It was uh, Douglas Aircraft initially. And um, what we're doing is uh, they had a system where uh, engineering drawings for aircraft were reviewed by checkers who did nothing but check. So it's not peer review, it's elitist review. And it wasn't working very well. We, changed, we used the inspection method, which uh, originally was a hardware idea. Then Fagan and Radis brought it into software. And we, we brought it, again, back to hardware. We're looking at aircraft engineering drawings like wings and kitchens kind of things. No software at all. But we, we discovered something very interesting. Uh, if we change the pro, if we set a, um, a, a, an exit criteria, it's called, if we set a goal that you will not release any engineering work if it exceeds a very small number of defects, like less than one per page, if you do that, you will motivate people to learn to do it right the first time, to actually read the standards and learn to apply them. Because we found the engineers were normally up there at about uh, 80 major defects per page, 80 violations of good engineering craft. Okay? And they were do they've been doing this for years. And the checkers would check and find about 30 and release about 50, causing chaos in the whole organization. And this was going on. This was the problem we were trying to solve. So we said, no, no, uh, we, we will set a level of no more than one major defect, meaning no more than one violation of the standards. We'll do peer review, that is your friends will review you, not your boss or an auditor. So we're back to <coughs> power at the bottom. And the peers will tell this young man who's just gotten a job as an engineer, uh, don't be surprised if we find 80 major defects in your drawing. Uh, we had the same problem to begin with. But we've cleaned up our act. We've learned systematically how to get, every time we do a drawing, to get down to one or something like that. And we learned a surprising thing that wasn't in the literature, which I call the personal improvement curve. If a person tries sincerely to get better, the next thing they produce will have half the defects. But that isn't good enough, you know, 80 to 40. And the next one will have about half, 23. This is a real curve from a real person called Gary. Okay, and the next will have half, about eight. And the, uh, the, the next one, if you get lucky, might be under the threshold. What, what are you doing? We're, we're using the engineering technique called inspection to gather data about how bad the work is, to, not to punish or reward, but to motivate individuals who are new to the organization and don't know all these nice rules and regulations that are clever engineering that the older people have figured out are a good idea. Okay? So they have to learn. And they, they're going through a personal learning curve. But the beauty is, when they have learned, if they've got any memory whatsoever, they can do this year after year if they don't forget how to do it. They are producing close to zero defect work, 100 times better at the outset. This has now been reproduced, for example, at Intel in software, where they're, uh, they're going from uh, levels of 100 down to less than 0 0.2 per page. We have published papers on that. So extreme reduction of software uh, errors uh, is, is what we are doing with that. OK. Um, just keep an eye on the famous clock. I've got nine minutes left. Um, I, I, I put together some data. Uh, which, uh, uh, it, it, for example, if you're doing this defect prevention thing, then it turns out in one year you can prevent 50% of all the bugs ever happening. But if you mature the process of prevention, you can go up to about 70 or 80% or more prevention. At NASA uh, and places like that, they are going for numbers, uh, almost uh, Six Sigma type numbers, like 99.9% .9 prevented okay, in time, in several years. Now, what you prevent, you don't have to find early by inspection. Early means it's cheaper to fix because it's early. Okay. And, uh, but what you do, do find with inspection, you don't have to find in testing, which is 10 times more costly and it delays the system. And then what you find in testing and fix, you don't have to give to the field. So this is a whole different picture of where the vast majority of the good work is being done by a method none of you have even heard of called defect prevention which is built on peer reviews and peer discussions of how to improve our organization. Try it out. Okay. By the way, we have a, a, how many people here from Ericsson, one of our sponsors? Okay. So you may or may not know, but in the 90s, uh, Kai and Tom Gilb did uh, training courses for a few thousand Ericsson employees, in, uh, although we never actually trained here. We actually had a conference in, in uh, 
in Croatia, a worldwide conference on inspection. But uh, uh, Ericsson learned a lot of this inspection thing, not, not so much the defect prevention, but inspection and practice it on a wide basis and, and claimed huge savings in finding bugs, like 90 million Swedish kroner were saved as one of the official numbers that came out of the Ericsson work. Okay. But right now, since there's a new generation of people since the 90s, how many people were there in the 90s and got trained by Gilb uh, at Ericsson? Uh, okay, well, Ben was at Ericsson too, and <laughs> okay, <laughs> the only guy in the room can raise his hand, Ben. Uh, uh, you need a double check here, like, how many people can raise their hands? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I, I thought he was the only one in the room that could do that. Okay, so, you know, maybe it's about time that at least the Ericsson people picked up on their past and, and uh, did, it was, it was done magnificently at Ericsson and maybe added the defect prevention process to go on there. So uh, I volunteer to come over on uh, Thursday morning and uh, remind Ericsson for free what they should do. <laughs> That's a serious offer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the afternoon is for the universities, right? OK. Uh, here, here's, here's some more data on it. Uh, for example, at uh, 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 IBM in Minnesota, one of the better uh, development labs, more successful ones, they had 200, uh, sorry, they had, brup, brup. let me get this one here, yeah. Let me get the data now. That's that, that's that. Um, right, okay. They had 1,822 suggestions for improvement between 1985 and 1994. So that's about, uh, let's just say that's 180 per year. These are suggestions for change of the environment. So this is not one big suggestion like go agile or do business process reengineering. This is, 2,000 implemented suggestions. About 10% are suggestions for better test planning. So it's at the detailed level change happens, the detailed increments, not the big idea. The big idea is allow people to find the many detailed suggestions and implement them. That's the big idea. That's called defect prevention process. It is not called lean, although it is arguably a lean technique. I will argue that case tomorrow in my course. Okay? It's a lean technique. Um, <laughs> enough of that. Uh, in uh, I, International Computers Limited in the 80s, uh, uh, I found I was working for the CEO, Rob Wilmot, and he was very much trying to release the power of the organization. And he had problems doing it because he was, he could only command his directors and his directors commanded everybody else and it's very much a command and control culture. But just for fun, I, I wrote this. And he, uh, the CEO liked it so much, he printed it up, put it on the wall everywhere. And basically, it's, it's a, I'm trying to release power. You have the right to try this out. You have the right to experiment. You have the right to get, you know, know what your measurements are. I was absolutely pushing, you know, giving. This is modeled on the American Bill of Rights, the right to free speech, the right to your religion, you know. And it, it really delegates power tremendously. So you, 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 could, you could use this in any company you like, and you, know, you can say, uh, borrowed from Tom Gilb and give me the Croatian version when you're done, okay? But uh, by the way, that company, um, using my methods, including this one, had been losing money for about seven or eight years. It went into profit for the next 14 years, and even their competitor, IBM, wasn't that good. So, uh, you know, it was doing a lot of things like this, uh, all the methods I, I'm talking about, quantifying all the objectives and stuff like that. They, they were, they were uh, doing it. So, uh, that was nice. Okay, now, looking at our time, what do we realistically have time for? Practically nothing. Um, okay. Uh, I think I have to be realistic. Uh, I certainly am not going to use the next 15 minutes of your coffee break to tell you things I'd like to tell you. So uh, if you want more of this, uh, number one, you can read the slides. Uh, number two, you can come on the course tomorrow. Okay. Uh, those are your choices, I guess. <laughs> or talk to me. Uh, the, the, the next one is even more practical examples of delegating power to uh, engineers and programmers to design. Okay. But I hope I've made my case, awakened interest in the fact that you might delegate more power and you might do more engineering and you might become a real systems engineer one day. Okay, and uh, above all, why don't we have a, a common goal? Instead of having 50% total failure of all IT projects worldwide, and I'll bet it's about the same in Croatia. Yeah, even little Norway, about your size, same problem. 
okay, analyzed locally. So we have a common culture inherited from these uh, ridiculous American salesmen who are selling us snake oil, as somebody put it yesterday. Okay, I've just decided to change my citizenship from American to Norwegian, so I won't be one of these ridiculous Americans. <laughs> okay, uh, it's true. <laughs> I will become a member of the European Union like you guys. Okay. It took me 55 years to make the decision. I was proud for a while, but uh, I, I'm, I'm no longer so proud to be quite. I'm more proud of Norway. Look to Norway. Uh, actually, you have a little bit of fun. If you look at the quality of life uh, surveys by United Nations, and just look at where Norway is, and look at where Slovenia is, and look at where US is, and you get an idea why. Norway is a nice place to live, and European Union's a nice place to live. So, OK. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll be here, of course, the rest of the day, happy to talk to people, available by email now and later, uh, here tomorrow holding a one-day seminar and uh, at the universities on Thursday, and who knows, I may end up at Ericsson on Thursday morning if the invitation is taken, and we can remind them what they have forgotten about the culture they so uh, expensively paid the guilds to teach them about. Okay, uh, now we have, uh, 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 it's time for a symbolic one minute. What's the one minute question with the quick question and the quick answer? Is the coffee ready, right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. The door. Dobry jutro. And uh, bef so everybody gets a shot at it. Here's your Croatian book on Agile coming up, first and only. Um, and coming out soon, May. OK, you just have to photograph that. Yeah, right. <laughs> you want to get me and it? Yeah, OK. Ta-da, read the book. <laughs> Voila, Molim. OK. Still coming. Oh, goodness, all these late people. Oh, well, you and I were boozing until midnight, so I understand. So. <laughs> Mike, welcome. OK, <clears throat> so uh, uh, I was asked to speak here at uh, Agile Conference. So I was quite surprised when they didn't pick all my Agile lectures that I do. They picked this power to the programmers. Uh, this is not a programming conference, is it? How many people here are like Kent Beck? They would rather program. <laughs> yeah, a lot of programmers here. So maybe this is why this got picked. So OK, fine. Uh, so, if you want to complain uh, or a question, uh, you can find my email there, sort of in code, so no hacker would ever find my email. <laughs> and then website. Uh, these are the site of the slides. I put them up yesterday. There may be some small changes. And uh, this is a video of a previous uh, version. This will be videoed, of course, but we're not quite sure when we get access to the link. Okay. Uh, universities there. So maybe you know somebody who was there. You can check out with them. Anyway, uh, big discussion, blah, 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 blah. And of course, the language, I didn't know quite what they were saying, but it was very animated. So I asked them, why the big discussion? You know, I just put across some common sense ideas. You should do things in small steps and deliver real value and learn from it. Why big discussion? And they said, uh, I should introduce this on, on the way. Uh, <laughs> it has something to do with Tito, of course. Uh, in 57, in Beograd, uh, Tito happened to be hosting Ho Chi Minh. And so uh, there was a big parade, and they were in a big open car, sort of looked like the open boat there. And I saw both of them with my very own eyes. So I'm, uh, you weren't even born, right? How many people were not born in, yet in 1957? I thought so. So I, I, I beat you to that one. I saw Tito and Ho Chi Minh on the, sa the same time. That's really good. I brag about that to my Vietnamese friends, and I brag about that here. I'm not quite sure what this says. I, w I didn't have time to get a translation, but I'm sure it's something horrible, like wanted for a terrorist or something like that. Yeah? So, uh, OK. But uh, I think this might have been almost the same day I saw them. So it looks like he was, uh, Tito's taking him for a boat, a boat ride, right? And he's obviously giving him an extra hat, which he's not very comfortable with. So anyway. But uh, so they, they said, well, uh, Tom, we have to explain to you. Um, in 1945, Tito essentially gave us a, uh, an assignment, um, you know, replan Yugoslavia.
author of our Croatian book coming up here, right? Okay. And uh, sort of give a little advertising space here while we warm up. <laughs> mm. And if you want to review the book before it's published, yeah, you're looking for reviewers. Uh -huh. And uh, I have accepted to write a kind of introductory foreword on the history of uh, Agile. Like so that in better. both Croatian and English it's going to come. So. <laughs> If anybody's really crazy, and they, they can dig up the slides on their iPhone and follow from their seats. There they are, slides. And if you're really, really crazy, you can parallel listen to a video talk of the same talk. <laughs> a stereo video. OK, time to start the talk on time. Or is that not done in Croatia? A <laughs> little bit yeah. academic court. As long as they're streaming in, maybe I should give them a chance. So. Yeah? Close. When I was uh, 17 years old and a young schoolboy in London, they decided we should have exchange with Yugoslavia for one month. So we rode <coughs> the train from London, believe it or not, all the way to Beograd. When we came to Ljubljana, nobody could pronounce this crazy sounding word with LJ. So we British schoolboys decided to call Ljubljana just number one. It was the first <laughs> big stop on the way. And we passed through Zagreb, I'm quite sure. How else could we get to Beograd? And uh, I spent the next month, uh, two weeks in Beograd, uh, visiting Dusan Toskovic. And in Slovenska, seven was the exact address. And then two weeks later, we were all in Mali, Loshin. Uh, enjoying the sun and the beautiful Serbian girls in their bikinis. <laughs> I was only 17, I was quite innocent. So. <laughs> and uh, I, I tried to study Croatian as best I could, so I, we, I spent almost all my time, even around the swimming pool, learning Croatian from my Croatian friends. Well, Serbo-Croatian, to be quite honest, they were mostly Serbs. Okay. But uh, that was my hobby. When I got back to London, I wrote my little diary in, in uh, Serbian. And if I couldn't remember a Serbian word, I put in a Spanish word, because I was studying Spanish. So I have the weirdest diary. It's uh, half Spanish, half Croatian, something like that. <clears throat> anyway, I, I fell in love with uh, uh, Yugoslavia and, and Yugoslavians at an early stage, especially Sonia and Sali, my two little girlfriends from uh, Novi Sad. I'll never forget them. <laughs> so. <clears throat> um, so uh, in 1972, I was invited by the uh, uh, University of Ljubljana to hold a three-day course on uh, 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 what was it called? Managing uh, uh, where's the exact title? I didn't manage to get in there. Uh, but, but you know, managing uh, things. Uh, eight lectures, three days, and we were there in uh, uh, Bord. And uh, the first first lecture I held was explaining agile. This is 1972. I explained there was a good idea to try to deliver value early, small increments, learn from it, make better decisions, do more, and keep on accumulating the value. That's called my EVO method. Okay? This is the uh, uh, first published Agile method. There were lots of Agile methods floating around, but I managed to get to the publication first, okay? as we'll see. Uh, and uh, after my first lecture on uh, uh, the Agile method known as EVO, big discussion amongst the people. There were uh, 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 two people who became very good friends of mine, uh, Willem Rupnik. I think he's no longer with us, but his son is in fact a professor in Ljubljana. We've managed to track and trace. Somebody here had a Facebook account with him. Now we have LinkedIn. So I'm going to hook up with him for fun because I, I dearly loved uh, Rupnik. And uh, Professor Leskovar was especially dear to me uh, because he was born same day as I was, <laughs> Christmas Eve. <laughs> and we have uh, kept contact, and he's uh, alive and well and retired. Uh, but, um, and there were professors from not just uh, uh, um, Ljubljana, but also Zagreb and other uh, 